Hello and welcome back to the Notcast. It is Friday, 7th of April, 2023. Today is Good Friday. So, um, happy crucifixion to Jesus. Hang on, that's not quite right. That's not quite how it works. But uh, yeah, today is Easter Friday, Good Friday. And I am going to be talking about the 10th-ish studio album released by Metallica. Um, a thing that is, to quote the Lord of the Rings, uh, not dark but beautiful and as terrible as the dawn. It is the um, <clears throat> the experience that when it, once it has been seen, it cannot be unseen. And that is Metallica and Lou Reed's joint collaborative album, Lulu. This is one wild and freaky ride of music, is the nice way of describing it. Um, it is a, a very, very strange record, indeed. And all the way through, whenever I, I kind of do these, and I, I start off and I think, I'm going to talk about a band, I'm going to have to talk about everything that they do. And occasionally, when I start off, I kind of think, that means I'm going to have to talk about Lulu. So, um, here we are. Uh, so released on I think October the thirty first, two thousand and eleven, um, it is the strangest of records. Um, the previous episode where I talked about Death Magnetic and the touring that went up to it and everything, blah blah blah, um, also included a slight allusion to the, the very genesis of this project. And I hate to use the word project when I talk about music. It kind of feels like why why is it a project if it's a project? That's like you know renovating a, a kitchen is a project making an album artistic expression that isn't a project is it well apparently it is and the band went into the studio in april 2011 uh, with lou reed and recorded until june 2011 doing something that was not 100 percent metallica um, and i kind of thought well what, what's that going to be is it going to be a continuation of the the stuff they'd done with the big four they were going to do an album a collaboration album with with people from anthrax and slayer and megadeth are, are, are they are they going to do something like that are they going to do a covers record are they going to have guest vocalists um and uh, they already have you know they did a, um, a they backed ray davis uh, on, a, on a, a track you really got me which was released in 2009 um they performed with ray davis at this concert the rock and roll hall of fame concert in 2009 at the madison square garden they also played a couple of songs i think sweet jane and white light white heat uh, with a chap called Mr. Lou Reed uh, of the, the Velvet Undergrounds. And, um, well, that wasn't exactly what I, when I was watching that. And I kind of thought, well, that sounds all right. It's interesting. You know, another Metallica cover version. There's loads of them going on. What I didn't have on my bingo card at all was that in 2011, two years later, they would release this uh, monstrosity, uh, a joint collaborative album of... Um, unreleased, unfinished Lou Reed songs with Metallica as his backing band. Effectively, Metallica putting themselves at the service of Lou Reed to, to finish an unfinished project. So this is the um, the, the deluxe edition uh, that was released on CD. It has two books inside it, and it has um, two CDs. Um, there was also a, a vinyl edition of Lulu. This is worth quite a lot of money these days. It wasn't worth quite a lot of money when I bought it. I think it's worth something like £100 or so these days. And um, that does not come from the quality of the music that, that is in it. Because when I bought it, I bought the uh, the CD uh, through gritted teeth, kind of wondering, going, is this really a good idea? And the answer is no. I think a collaborative album with Lou Reed is something that works far, far better as an idea than it does as a finished project you sit there and you go well what about the possibilities that go inside this record what could it possibly sound like and your imagination cannot prepare you for this record there is nothing in your imagination that would sit down and go well yeah you know if Metallica and, and Lou Reed do an album well it's going to be a double album it's going to have 10 songs on it it's going to be a triptych song cycle based upon uh, two Lulu plays that were written in 1895 uh, by uh, a German guy um, and it's going to be Lou Reed rewriting that and then Metallica riffing over the top of it whilst Lou, Lou speaks the words. Now, as, as we know, Lou Reed was not the best singer in the universe um, and that wasn't his area or his forte. It wasn't what he was best at. Um, probably what he was best at was, was creating art and his work was most definitely art. It uh, doesn't always mean it was very good. It doesn't always mean it meant anything. I've got all his albums apart from... 
I think what's it, Hudson River Meditations, the instrumental one he did in 2007, uh, which was designed to meditate while you looked at the Hudson River. I've got all, the, all of his albums apart from that, and uh, I saw him live a couple of times, uh, including one of his last gigs in 2011, less than a year before he finished touring. And uh, well, my, my approach to that was um, very good, but I appreciated him a lot more than I loved him. And so the the idea that Metallica would be his backing band just didn't seem like something that seemed in any way probable. And when it was announced that, yes, he'd recorded an album with Metallica, I'm like, well, OK, you know that gear for the guy that's blinking? I was like, that. I was like, mm, OK, well, I guess we're going to we're going to go on that ride. We're going to see what happens. And uh, as I said, the, the reality of Lulu existing is certainly um, a thing. It's probably the nice way to describe it. Is it a good thing? No, it absolutely isn't. It exists better as a record that you've never heard, as opposed to a record that you have heard and does exist. It can't, once you've heard it, it can't be unheard. It can't be unseen. It's, uh, it can't be unmade. It is not dark, but beautiful and terrible as the dawn, as Galadriel says in the film of Lord of the Rings. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just one of those things that where you sit there and you experience it and you kind of go at the end of it and you go, well, that was a thing. Kind of like when people walked out of uh, the Phantom Menace and uh, they, they were like, mm, that's that's not great. Or as my experience when I watched Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, I came out of it and went, well, of all the movies I've seen this year, that is one. So, Lulu. And uh, I've got to say, I'm not a fan of the cover art either. It seems a bizarrely um, unusual set of cards. Now, I understand thematically where the cover art for this album uh, exists and why it exists in this particular way what i will say is the whole album lyrically is absolutely dripping in not misogyny but misanthropy it seems to be a loathing of all humanity uh, for all of its foibles and its weaknesses in fact misanthropy is probably one of the one of the you know the the main kind of exports of lou reed is having a very general a generally a very very low opinion of humanity as a whole is that all human beings are pretty awful uh, and that comes through in every single second of Lulu. Now this is the, the deluxe edition CD, um, this is the first of the two books that goes with it, this is the uh, the lyric book uh, which goes goes with that and I think whilst I talk through the album um, I will quickly, there's a bit of explanatory text on here and it's probably important to put it in the context of what the album actually is. It's a musical collaboration between Lou Reed and Metallica based upon uh, German expressionist writer Frank Wedekind's plays Earth Spirit and Pandora's Box, um, which were published in the early 1900s and uh, tell the story of a young abused dancer's life and relationships, collectively known as the Lulu plays. Uh, they spawned a silent film called Pandora's Box, an opera and countless other creative endeavours. Apparently, they challenged the sexual and moral standards of their day and have remained highly controversial. Um, and uh, the Lulu project using Lou's un... un, un uh, unfinished lyrics so he didn't have music to go with these lyrics uh god knows what else is in the Lou Reed archive and Metallica kind of put themselves at the service of the songs and then created this so the idea of this, this sexualized ballet dancer is shown through the the use of this this clearly kind of somewhat obviously naked mannequin uh, of of ancient times probably dating from around about 1920 this idea of a kind of like a, an idealization of a, or a, a representation of a woman but not actually a, a real life human but uh, an object that exists in, in in a man's imagination a creation of a woman that isn't actually real or a, a toy or a plaything or something like that um, and the whole thing about it, even down to the art which is let's not muck about here it is graphic it is a little bit grotesque i don't particularly like it um, so hence why I've moved the um, the CD cover art through to, to say this instead, which is probably the least offensive of the CD panels that are in the booklet, although that, that is, is also pretty good. But everything in, in the cover is, is it kind of like looks at, at, at sex as a, a way of, of, oh dear, I don't like that one, or that one for that matter. Um, it is not a pleasant experience, this album at all. Um, you kind of watch it or listen to it, and you kind of think of it in terms of it being almost like a forbidden knowledge, just something like Cannibal Holocaust or scanners or something that, that you watch it and you go, I've seen this, I can't go back now. Once it has been seen, it can't be unseen, it can't be unknown. Um, it's, uh, I think it's almost to say it's, it, 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 it can defile the, um, the, the, the listener because it is not a pleasant record in the slightest. Um, 
I'm going to go for this booklet instead. This one's a little bit better, I think, actually. Um, and by the way, I did not pay money, uh, well, not much money for this. I paid about five pounds for this with the two books in and the two CDs. And to be fair, I think I think I got ripped off there because it's it's more of an artifact as opposed to anything else. Um, the album as a whole is it's weird, and I'm not going to muck about. It's very sexual. It very much approaches the concept of sex and relationships as a power dynamic. It, it approaches, um, you know, the, the use and abuse of uh, a woman as, as a power play uh, by a man who's very clearly an abuser. Um, the lyrics are very graphic. They're very unflinching. They are grotesque and intentionally grotesque. It is not beautiful, but it's very, very competent in its descriptions of really unpleasant events. Um, and it, undoubtedly, if you if there's a trigger warning for it, this is not a fun album to listen to if you have been in any way in an abusive relationship. Uh, and the idea of um, Lou Reed kind of beseeching upon you or imparting his, his uh, forbidden knowledge as a, a highly sexualized pensioner is pretty scary to be honest in this record i do not like it it also has of course the the lyric i am i am the table yeah in the song the view not a great song uh, it's almost as if it's metal machine music updated for the year 2011 it feels like it's made out of metallica offputs of riffs that they had used but not yet put to songs and then it had been put oh, for example that lyric spermless like a girl i mean oh my god that is grotesque isn't it it's kind of like i feel you know like when you were younger uh, there was a sex scene in a movie and you were watching maybe terminator and your parents were in the room and then all of a sudden the sex scene turns up and it's like Oh, I feel kind of awkward because I don't necessarily want... And it just feels gratuitous, I think, is probably the word for it. Um, there's a time and a place for phrases like that. Probably not on a Metallica and Lou Reed album. And, uh, you know, the new, like in the sunshine, you kind of got these pictures of these, these guys kind of just walking about and you're kind of going, well, you know, you're, you're rich and well-off and what are you going to do? Well, you're going to write an album which is really tough. Um, it's taken me a long time to get to find a way in to the Lulu album that I, I like. Um, and I've had to approach it from a certain point of view, which is, it's not a Metallica. It's nothing to do with Metallica. Metallica just happened to play on it. Metallica are Lou Reed's backing band. They're there to serve his vision and uh, his, his, his ideation of what he wants to communicate about power and sex and abuse and relationships and um, it just seems really weird also of course I, I am as you have known from the previous episodes i have a view that art should be created because there is a compulsion in the artist to make the art and it shouldn't be done as a project or as a whimsy and this feels more like uh, an exercise in in music and sound as opposed to an art of um you know unrestrained creativity um well there, there you have it um the production on it, by the way, fabulous. The drum sound, brilliant. This is the best Metallica have sounded uh, in a long time. It's better than Saint Anger. It's better than uh, Death Magnetic. Uh, I, I really love the production on this record, but I don't love the music absolutely at all. The songs themselves have have very little in the way of structure. Um, there's endless riffing, there's repetitive kind of 24, 48 bars of exactly the same stuff with the only kind of punctuation in the songs being the, um, the, the, the kind of like the cymbal crashes. Uh, in fact, the word idiocy there probably represents my, my view around it, the album. It is uh, a very, very tough meal to eat. It is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a good record at all um which is then pretty hard for me to say i found a way to make the album work for me uh which is by by remixing and re-editing it um 
Um, so I, I've changed the track listing and the running order. And I've trying to change the arrangements of some of the songs and some of the structure of some of the songs to make it work for me. But I will get to that in a moment because the opening lines from this album make it extremely clear to every man, woman and child that this album is not only not taking prisoners, it's going to kill them in front of you. Because the opening line is, I would cut my legs and tits off when I think of Boris Karloff and Kinski in the dark of the moon. And it all goes downhill from there. It pins its colours. It's very bloody, very graphic colours to the mass, right from the moment that it starts off. Um, and the songs are, are, bluntly put, in the released version, they are boring. It's monotone, almost monolithic, kind of almost trying to crush you or grind you down like being under a steamroller. I think you could say, it, as an album, it's the ultimate representation of artistic integrity. The, the idea that um, the ultimate expression of control and the ultimate expression of, of, of self-belief is that I will do what I want and you cannot stop me. So to that extent, you could probably look at Lulu and think of it in the same way as you might uh, Neil Young's is trans, for example, for which I think he was uh, sued for being unrepresentative of what Neil Young might be, or Talk Talk's Spirit of Eden. It's a com an absolute triumph of artistic control and integrity over all other commercial considerations, which is reflected in the album's frankly piss poor sales. It sold 13,000 copies in week one, which from Metallica, who sold something like 30 million copies of the Black Album, uh, is, is a testament to, to the fact that this album did not go far. By 2014, it had sold 33,000 copies in America. And by 2023, it sold 280,000 copies worldwide, which is a way of saying that you know, Metallica played to more people in the weekend than have bought copies of this album. Um, and that's probably for the best, all things considered. It's devoid of any commercial pressure or... or um, What's well, an awareness of, of how commercial or uncommercial this record is. It's something different. It's something new, unique. It's something pretretty bloody horrible, actually, uh, as, as a record. It's cruel. It's vulgar. It feels spurned. Um, it feels as if it's an album that, that very clearly kind of just identifies and address, addresses with, with a loathing of all humanity. You know, some of, some of the lyrics are really, really un, un, unpleasant. Um, I've changed the sequence, by the way, on my version. So the version on, on, on the retail version is Brandenburg Gate, uh, and then The View, Pumping Blood, Mistress Dread, Iced Honey, Cheat On Me, and then on CD2, or LP2, Frustration, Little Dog, Dragon, and Junior Dad. Uh, and Junior Dad, by the way, contains uh, 11 minutes of, of violin tuning and feedback at the end, presumably to switch it over to a running length of 89 minutes so it wouldn't fit on one CD. It would have to fit on two CDs, and it could therefore count as one album in the contract as opposed to half an album because it's only one CD, for example. You could argue, actually, that since the band uh, pretty much ended their contract with uh, the record label, Vertigo, uh, after the release of this, is that the band effectively became their own masters. And this was a way of Metallica achieving a commercial output of becoming um, ahead of and released from the confines of their contracts. So they can then be effectively masters of their own domain. Uh, and they had to offset that with the release of their final album, through the Never, which was a live concert recording, and the Beyond the Magnetic EP, which both of which felt a little bit like commercial considerations that existed to get the band out of their contracts so they could form their own label and become masters of their own destiny. Um, it's 89 minutes long. It's 89 unpleasant minutes long. I would really hesitate to recommend this to anybody. It's a very good Lou Reed album. It's a piss poor Metallica one is Lulu and I have really really struggled with it over the years it's only recently as I've said that I have by re-editing the songs and rearranging the songs and putting them into different orders that I've made a version of the album that works for me and the version that works for me opens with Mistress Dread uh, and then goes to The View, Brandenburg Gates, uh, a re-edit of Frustration that moves some of the sections around there's an acoustic intro to Frustration I was stuck into the middle of the song uh, we have Dragon uh, which has then taken the ending from that 
and moved it into to, um, another part of another song. We have Iced Honey, Junior Dad, which I've now um, cross mixed into the beginning of Cheat On Me and the final track being Pumping Blood. And Pumping Blood, the idea being for those last three songs is that the, the character who is doing the cheating is the Junior Dad and that becomes his downfall, uh, hence Pumping Blood being the last song on the album. And the idea that when the heart stops, the album stops is, is pretty much where I am with it. It's I've tried really, really hard to like this, and I don't uh, in, in its finished version. And I have taken uh, the uh, the track, I think, Little Dog off because it's just Lou and an acoustic guitar, and it is not fun at all. So Lulu uh, by Lou Reed and the Metallicas is awful. And I do not recommend it to anybody at all. Uh, it is not good. Um, so there, there we go. And that is, of course, reflected in the, frankly, awful sales of this awful album. It is the worst thing that Metallica have released. It is probably the worst thing that Lou Reed has released, apart from Metal Machine Music. Um, and it is almost definitely the worst thing I've heard recently, because I haven't heard Metal Machine Music for an extremely long time indeed. Uh, it's a misanthropic slice of general unpleasantness about humans, human frailty, human stupidity, and human everything else. And it fell flat on its face commercially. It got utterly lambasted in the uh, in, in in the press. The reviews were atrocious. The record was almost as bad as the reviews. And uh, for me, my fa uh, my favourite part of Lulu is the um, the silence between the songs. Actually, I can't pretend it isn't. Um, and it felt as if the band had somehow massively screwed up. And then they, they kind of backtracked that enormously with the release of the Beyond Magnetic EP. And the Beyond Magnetic EP was first previewed at a series of fan club shows in December 2011. The XXX shows where the band kind of recognised their 30th anniversary, playing four shows at the San Francisco Fillmore, uh, which did have a very limited commercial release as a, a special Metal Hammer magazine and single. Um, and the single features this here, the XXX 7-inch single featuring So What Live uh, with Animal from the Anti-Nowhere League and Through the Never Live um, at the... Uh, the Fillmore Theatre on a seven inch single, which came in a pack alongside this magazine. Uh, this is an interesting little release. It's not uh, it's not absolutely essential. Um, it's, it's worth having. It's, it's more of a, an expanded kind of advert for the fan club to try and get people to join the fan club and to download the four live shows. And the four live shows, by the way, are I regard as absolutely essential Metallica live shows to uh, to own or listen to uh, the band featured the band played four completely different sets with only one song that was repeated seek and destroy the last song of every night um, and played lots of songs that they hadn't played for a long time uh, and played with a lot of guests so for example night one they had uh, biff from saxon uh, and they had um, oh, somebody else's name i've forgotten and jason from um, from the earlier lineup of Metallica, and they played the Call of Cthulhu, Four Horsemen, Carpe Diem, Baby, a new track called Hate Train, did uh, Judas Kissed, um, or more correctly, Don't Judas Me, uh, Motorcycle Man by Saxon, and a Diamond Head medley. So Diamond Head also joined them on stage, and uh, that was um, an, uh, an interesting set list. Um, on the seventh, which was the, the second show, uh, they played To Live Is To Die. Uh, Wasting My Hate, Iced Honey, The View, both of those two with Lou Reed, The Merciful Fate medley, a track called Just a Bullet Away, um, and uh, they had uh, guests Lou Reed and Merciful Fate with them as well. Probably Jason, I come to think of it. On the 9th, um, they played again some songs that they hadn't played either live or not for a long time, most notably Suicide and Redemption, To Hell and Back, Tuesday's Gone, and with Rob Halford from The Jewish Priests, uh, a track called Rapid Fire that they played in 1994. Um, they had the mis some members of the Misfits on stage with them as well. Um, and then on, on the 10th night, or more likely the 10th of December, the last night, they played Orion, uh, Rebel of Babylon, Dirty Window, Frantic, 
the Black Sabbath medley with Ozzy Osbourne. And I also had uh, guests Bob Rock to play bass on the St. Anchor tracks. And um, Dave Mustaine came and played some of the earlier material as well. And on each one of those four nights, they played a new song, previously unreleased, uh, which totaled four songs in all, uh, which were then released free to fan club members and then later formed uh, an EP that was released in uh, January 2012 on CD and in April uh, 2012 on vinyl that was the beyond magnetic ep available here on cd and silver colored vinyl this really felt like metallica realized they'd massively shot themselves in the foot uh, with the, with the release of lulu and they were like desperately scrambling around going we need to get fans back we need to remind fans that we're not just this terrible band uh, that do the backing for lou reed and uh, so they, they released Beyond Magnetic, which is four songs which were finished and mixed in March 2008 um, and uh, before the final touches were put onto the Death Magnetic album and it had a, a limited one run kind of uh, semi-transparent silverish vinyl uh, there, um, which was out for Record Store Day in 2012 in the days when people... Um, were still excited by Record Store Day and not bankrupted by it and where you didn't get, you know, a coloured vinyl Jan Hammer 12-inch or something clogging up the stores for 35 quid. Um, this came with apparently a high-quality, this is according to the sticker on the front, a high-quality Metallica sticker. Not that I'm necessarily anybody would stick this onto anything. Why you would do that, I don't know. Um, and the uh, the CD release, it really felt like Beyond Magnetic was a sudden case of backtracking. Metallica realising, oh, we've shot ourselves in the foot. Lulu's a piece of crap. Everybody hates it. We need to remind people what Metallica are at. Let's dust off those four tracks that we've got lying around and quickly release them. And bearing in mind that this was uh, this came out uh, six weeks after Lulu was issued uh, in terms of downloads and live performances. So the band very quickly realised Oh, we've fucked this, and um, they needed to get something out. So you got four tracks, Hate Train, Just a Bullet Away, To Hell and Back, and Rebel of Babylon on, uh, I think, a 28-minute EP. Um, these songs are not regularly in Metallica set lists these days, um, uh, but they were played live um, for the first show, and um, it was a real case of, of trying to, to recover some lost ground. It sold 36,000 copies in week one on CD, and by 2016, it sold 213,000 copies uh, worldwide. Now, of course, hardly anyone was selling half a million copies of anything at this point, uh, but Metallica very clearly had realised they'd, they'd fucked it, uh, to put it technically, and they needed to go and do something else. And what they needed to do was to maintain that perception of Metallica as a good, strong band that played live. So they started off 2012, they announced the Black Album 20th Anniversary Tour. Unsurprisingly, playing absolutely huge, enormous, enormous domes, stadiums and festivals across Europe, as well as um, the initial nights of the Orion Music Festival, which they launched in Atlantic City in June 2012. Here is a webcast which is now available as a bootleg DVD of the first of the Orion shows. Uh, one night the band played Ride the Lightning in full, the other night they played the Black Album in full, and they played the Black Album back to front uh, to try and um, bring people in. So people go, oh, you know, Metallica, that great band. And, and although there's an element of them kind of striding forward and going, well, we did Master of Puppets in 2006 for its 20th anniversary. Of course we're going to do the Black Album in 1992 for its 20th anniversary. But there's an element of, of all of this is being driven by the huge smack in the face that was the, the very, very critical reception that Lulu justly received because Lulu, put technically, is a bag of shit. And... Um, the band then also kind of doubled down on that. So they did the first of the initial Orion festivals. With the idea, well, we'll, we'll sort our own festival. We'll play and, you know, we'll, we'll headline stadiums and we'll charge money for tickets and people will come to see us. And they went into the festival business, uh, which lost them a lot of money um, because they did Orion again in 2013, uh, which is captured on this bootleg DVD called Rock in Rio 2013 and more, which features three shows. It features the, uh, the Rio de Janeiro show in September 2013, alongside Detroit, 
uh, on 8th of June 2013 where they played Killer Morning Fall and the Orion Festival on the, on the June the 9th where they headlined at the main stage uh, in the evening played a number of, of pretty rare tracks in that set but they lost about mm, £30,000 between uh, sorry £30 million between the Orion Festivals and their next release Through the Never Through the Never is a Metallica live album and uh, live concert film in 3D and that reminds me um, that I haven't got the Blu-ray with me so I'll be back in a second with that but Through the Never is a folly is the nice way of describing it so a folly is when a rich person has an idea put technically it's a pissing contest um, Britain is very good at follies um, so for example very tall towers that are built because people have lots of money and they want to show off how much money they've got by building a really tall tower or a really stupid ostentatious big building if you're a rock star of course your idea of a folly is, your, is a concert movie um, and uh, you too did it with U2 3D Led Zeppelin did it with the song Remains the Same and the nearest comparison for Through the Never is Zeppelin's The Song Remains the Same and The Song Remains the Same is, is similar because it is not one show and it is interrupted constantly the live footage with interstitial short films and now Through the Never is not a good film um, as a, I saw it in the cinema as a 3D movie experience uh, disc one and disc two there with the Blu-ray release. Um, and uh, it effectively follows this chap here, uh, a, a actor uh, by the name of Dane Dehan, and um, who is a roadie for Metallica, who is tasked with finding a magic bag whilst the band are on stage. I don't know what quite's in what quite is in the bag, very similar to Pulp Fiction, um, but it's got uh, you know him chasing the bag through all kinds of weird shit that's going on so it is like a series of cutscenes from a bad uh, mission in Grand Theft Auto now through the never as a film concert footage is fantastic very very good I'd much rather have just seen that uh, but that's not quite how it works but it's about a prosaic search for a thing and I watched John Wick 4 the other day um, and again John Wick 4 feels like it's a series of video game missions and levels that have been put into the narrative structure of a film through the never feels like exactly the same but with Metallica doing the soundtrack and it's about a man's quest for a bag and then he finds the bag and then he goes and delivers it to the band or whatever's in the bag uh, quite why the band have lost the bag I don't know um, now there were four pitches that were made uh, to Metallica for Through the Never uh, I think three of them um, I featured what I would have thought would have been an ideal subject matter for a Metallica feature film so if you think about all the Metallica songs and the underlying themes and ideas that go through all of those songs it's around a quest for identity it's around a quest for um, self-determination around a quest for control uh, it's around um, having a you know a quest to, to not be subject to the powers that be that force you to be somebody that you aren't all of those ideas went out of the window in the search for the imaginary bag of dreams by uh, by Dane Dehart um, whereas my, my, my kind of idea would have been to take the songs and create a narrative structure in through the never around somebody breaking through the fourth wall of control and power and uh, that's imposed upon them and being able to assert and control their own identity and, and achieve their own ideas and ambitions but no Metallica wanted the search for the incredible bag in Through the Never uh, and it cost something like 32 million dollars to make it sold 7.9 million dollars of tickets so it lost the band something at somewhere in the region of 25 million dollars which on top of Orion not breaking its costs means that the band lost about 30 35 million in 2012 and 2013 it's very very similar uh, to me to the indulgence that is the song remains the same and to a lesser extent the indulgence that is also Pink Floyd's The Wall um, although the concert footage is amazing and it was re released on the 23rd of September 2013 as um, a film in the cinemas and also a CD here and as a coloured vinyl 3LP live box set through the never um, as a live release this is perfectly serviceable it's very good actually it's it's a well recorded well presented audio and uh, it has um has a, a lovely um 
Uh, again, pretty graphic kind of cutout thingy. Um, and you've got uh, LP number one of Through the Never. Uh, this is on black vinyl. Uh, this features um, the, the tracks. Uh, the Ecstasy of Gold, Creeping Death, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and One, um, alongside Ride the Lightning and um, oh, Fuel. So, so there you go, on a, on a black vinyl disc. There is also a, uh, a second disc two, which I think is red, has the memory remains wherever I may roam and cyanide, as well as and justice for all and master of puppets. There it is. Unsurprisingly, that is blood red. That's uh, that's your LP number two, and your third disc in your box set, uh, which I think this is white vinyl. I think. Let's go and find out. It is white vinyl and features. Um, Battery, nothing else matters. A truncated version of Enter Sandman on white vinyl. Hit the lights as encore, and then a soundcheck version of Orion. And and this was um, recorded over a number of dates at Vancouver and Edmonton in August 2012. Um, now the band had proclaimed that this was going to be the thing that was going to set their touring template for years to come. They performed kind of in the round, well it wasn't really round, but they performed with a, a four-sided stage and they also had a, uh, a series of props that came up through the floors at various points and kind of collapsed down. So you had the, um, the, the electric chair for, for Ride the Lightning that, that conducted electricity through the arena. Um, you had Doris, the, uh, the, the Statue of Justice from the, from the Unjustice for All album. And um, you had all, all of the stuff that went with it. Ideal for cinematic presentation, but very expensive staging. And I think the band were putting that staging and sinking it into the film costs in the hope that they'd be able to recoup the cost of that staging through the concert movie, which of course they didn't. Um, the idea that you would be able to recoup your concert costs through through a, a concert movie was uh, ambitious, is the nice way of putting on it. Putting it. And there was a, a limited edition, as I've said, a limited edition vinyl release of the album, which is here um, through the Never. Uh, I suspect there's a, there's a more prosaic, more standard version of it that has been released since. Um, but yeah, there, there you are. That is that is through the Never, 33 RPM, limited edition, uh, triple live album um, recorded and soundtrack for the film. Twisting, turning through the Never. Now, if you were gonna name a Metallica film, um, certainly through the never wouldn't be the title I would choose as I've mentioned before the the narrative construction that I would have for it and the plot that I would have for it was about someone's quest for identity and control of self-determination and I would call it master of puppets and that is why I didn't get the film pitch and other people did um, it is a folly I think is the, is the best way of describing through the never and uh, it is um, generally forgotten about these days it's probably on amazon prime or something um and on dvd but it is not um it's not all that really that and beyond magnetic and orion it felt like these were acts of consolidation from metallica metallica kind of slipping into you know the sexy underwear and reminding you of who they used to be many years ago after they totally fudged it with that ill-advised liaison with uh Mr. Lou Reed. Um, there was a couple of other releases which came out around about the same time. Um, there were two Japanese only live albums. Um, these were recorded at, uh, let me just quickly check, Tokyo, Japan on August the 10th, 2013, and in Osaka on August the 11th, 2013. These were only sold through Tower Records in Japan and were quite expensive for a period of time. I managed to pick them up for about £30 each by using patience and an available bank balance. Um, and uh, these feature two live shows uh, later on. So this features, um, they changed the set list night, night, night to night. So this one features Holier Than Thou, Four Horsemen, The Day That Never Comes, Carpe Diem, Baby, Orion. And uh, this one features um, Ride the Lightning, Harvester of Sorrow, Fate of Black, The Memory Remains, and Justice for All, 
and uh, well, I think uh, Creeping Death and Battery on there. Um, these are absolutely un inessential. Metallica, Live Metallica, sounds much the same as all, all the other Live Metallica, to be honest. The fact that these were retail only releases in Japan is a little bit of a rip off. They should have sold them through the fan club, but they didn't, which makes it three Live Metallica albums in a row uh, once you've got Through the Never and Japan, uh, Tokyo, and Osaka. And there was also um, a well, the band was selling through LiveMetallica.com uh, burnt CDRs of live shows, um, normally in trifold packs like this with cover stickers on. Uh, this one I bought because I, I wanted to buy a couple of other shows that I'd attended and uh, I could make up the numbers. So I bought this, which is the, uh, the Los Angeles Music Cares AAP Fund concert in May 2014, which is an acoustic set featuring a cover version of I Just Want to Celebrate, when a blind man cries, which I think is Deep Purple, in my life by the Beatles, whoever they are, and Diary of a Madman, uh, which is an Ozzy Osbourne solo track. That is, of course, not all, because the band carried on. They doubled down on the live album releases, and in 2015, they released four, four, mail order only, quadruple live vinyl albums. Shows in Bogota, Helsinki, Istanbul and I think somewhere else probably I don't I don't even remember where actually now these sold originally at $89.99 each and were limited to just 500 copies I bought these copies when they were reduced in a, a closeout sale for $30 each they now sell for something like £200 which is ridiculous money when you think about it but they polled the fans and they said we're going to release four of our live concert recordings on vinyl and uh, as limited editions 500 copies and you get to pick the shows uh bogota was one of them uh, and uh, it features uh, each of the the band members there uh, along on as alongside a uh, like a just a, a relatively standard generic uh, box and um, then features also, by the way, a new track called Lords of Summer, which the band recorded and demoed in 2014. This is Helsinki, uh, which again features photos from Helsinki. Again, um, a by request set. List. So the band did a tour called By Request and fans would vote for the songs that they would want you to play. And of course, some fans were like, well, we really want them to play Frayed Ends of Sanity because they haven't played Frayed Ends of Sanity. So, of course... They did Frayed Ends of Sanity, and they did a number of other songs. Um, Frayed Ends of Sanity, by the way, does appear on the Helsinki show here from May the 28th, 2014, um, alongside a, a number of other uh, select and, and rare choices uh, from the band's set list. And it's surprising when the band get to choose, the, or more quickly, when the fans get to choose the set list, how few St. Anger songs people actually choose. They should choose more. And then the, the third one here, Istanbul, July 13th, 2014. Again, photographs of Metallica live in Istanbul, which I think is in Turkey. Oh, it's in Istanbul, not Constantinople. Um, and uh, they're on a quadruple vinyl LP. Uh, now, this is um, the, uh, this, the... They only had three of the four shows, which were discounted. The other one sold out. So I just decided to get these three instead. Uh, buy a couple of fan club magazines and um, some some extra kind of closeout stuff. Uh, this features uh, a cover version of Turn the Page, which you know, I'm not a fan of, and, and Justice for All, and a track called Lords of Summer. The track Lords of Summer, of course, being the single that was released in 2015 for Record Store Day. Um, this is the 12-inch of Lords of Summer featuring the first pass version, so that's the studio demo, back to the live version recorded in Rome of Lords of Summer and that then leads the band into their next studio album called Hardwired to Self-Destruct that was released in 2016. That is another Metallica episode which I will get to shortly. Um, this was a, a strange, strange period actually to be a Metallica fan. Um, was obviously you had the three live albums, uh, four live albums that were released. In fact, if you included uh, Tokyo and Osaka and through the never you actually had seven official Metallica retail uh, live albums that were released alongside a concert film and an EP and um, the, uh, the the Lou Reed album uh, which was uh, if you're a Metallica fan this was a strange strange period 
to be a fan of the band. It really, really was. I can't say I was a huge fan of some of the business decisions or the creative decisions that the band were making at this point. And that is, I think, probably where I'm going to uh, wrap up and uh, say thank you for watching yet another episode of Mark Talking About Yet Another Band. And I will catch up with you all later, further down the line. Um, take care of yourselves and each other. Stay beautiful. Uh, if you want to listen to this stuff, it's all on YouTube. You don't have to buy it. And some of it isn't particularly good. Um, I bought it. Now, why? I'm a completist. That's who I am. Uh, the guy that I am is is the guy that has to own the things. Part of that probably psychology comes from the fact that when I was younger, I couldn't afford to buy the things. I couldn't buy the things that I wanted. I couldn't buy the things that I, re I really felt were part of me. And I'm kind of compensating for that as an adult later on. Yeah, I know. I know I'm being honest about it, but there is very little choice to be anything other, other than honest, isn't there? And um, I think I might start to run out of hat space in my house actually um, I might just run out of space and then just not buy things mm, that's not going to happen is it I'm just going to end up flocking stuff or something I don't know um, right, two episodes in two days too many probably according to some people I should uh, quit my yak yakking and uh, let's boogie as they said in Spinal Tap and I will catch up with you all later um, as I've mentioned previously on Twitter if Twitter still exists in the future who knows if you have ideas for episodes do put them into the comments or um, do let me know uh, because I would be interested to know what other people would be interested in hearing or seeing actually not just what I think is interesting but what other people think is interesting as well so that is Metallica's worst studio album Lou Reed's worst studio album uh, a good Lou Reed album a bad Metallica album and some hasty backtracking to try and uh, save face. So, see you all later. I will put links to lots and lots of live shows in the comments. And uh, I'm not going to go off and have my dinner now. So, um, adios amigos. Stay beautiful. Bye.